Hello, everybody. Pastor Barry here, Griffin Baptist Church in Pickens, South Carolina. Coming to you today on Wednesday, like I do every Wednesday, for this prayer time that I like to spend together in the Valley of Vision prayer guide book. I've been thinking about this prayer today, um, jotted down some stuff I want to go over. If you're here for a motivational speech or some sort of uh, pick me up, uh, you're probably in the wrong place. I'm the type of preacher that thinks that what's wrong with preachers in America today is no one wants to kill them anymore. So there's probably going to be a few things in here that I have to say today about this that are going to upset you. But we need to embrace those wounds. We need to uh, understand that, like Scripture says, wounds from a friend are, are to be trusted. And so I mean that in this way. I'm not trying to hurt anybody or anything, but we need to look at ourselves and Man, ministers need to be bold enough to just come out and say some spiritual truths. So this morning, I want to read you this prayer, and then I want us to consider it, and there are going to be some hard truths to consider within it. This is a prayer that the Puritan had written hundreds of years ago called Christ is All. You think, how could that be controversial? We'll get into it. As you listen to this prayer, let it into your mind. Let it seep down into your heart. Let this prayer be also your prayer. O lover, to the uttermost, may I read the meltings of thine heart to me, in the manger of thy birth, in the garden of thy agony, in the cross of thy suffering, in the tomb of thy resurrection, in the heaven of thy intercession. Bold in this thought, I defy my adversary, tread down his temptations, Resist his schemings, renounce the world, and valiant for truth. Deepen in me a sense of my holy relationship to thee, as spiritual bridegroom, as Jehovah's fellow, as a sinner's friend. I think of thy glory and of my vileness, of thy majesty and of my meanness, of thy beauty and of my deformity, of thy purity and my filth of thy righteousness and of my iniquity. Thou hast loved me everlastingly and unchangeably. May I love thee as I am loved. Thou hast given thyself for me. May I give myself to thee. Thou hast died for me. May I live for thee. In every moment of my time, in every movement of my mind, in every pulse of my heart, may I never dally with the world in its allurements but walk by thy side, listen to thy voice, be clothed with thy graces, and adorned with thy righteousness. Amen. That's, if you're honest at all with yourself, and you're listening to that prayer, it should be challenging you. Um, because the question is, well, the announcement is, Christ is all. Christ is all. Christ is everything. Christ is all. It's all about him. Everything you know. Everything is all about Christ. It's all about Him. It's all for Him. It's all created by Him. It's all for Him. Everything you know. All of the universe, existence, consciousness, your family, the, every blade of grass in your yard, all of it is all about Him and it's all for Him. It's all for His glory. It's all about His glory. Now how often, I mean you, we hear that and we go, yeah, preacher, okay. But how often do we think that all of that, or even half of that, or one of those things, how often do we think any of that is all about us? Hey, Gina, how often do we think any of that is all about us? We do it so often, don't we? We constantly think that my job is about me, and my money is about me, and my relationships is about me, and my church is about me, and my grass is about me. It, none of it's about you. None of it's for you. None of it was created by you. It's all about God. It's all about His glory. Christ is all. It's all about Him. This is a really hard truth, and I think it's a hard truth for our day and time because this is a narcissistic, self-indulged, self-concerned, preference-driven, consumer-concerned society. And so everything, it's, that kind of stuff is seeping into everything. It's, it seeps into even our churches. I mean, you think about, I was talking to somebody this week, there's 100 churches in a 20-mile radius. You know what that turns into? 100 different preferences in a 20-mile radius. And church doesn't 
become this thing where people go to it and say, well, this is all about Christ, and this is all about glory in Christ, and this is all about growing in Christ. It comes, becomes this thing people go to it, and they say, well, I don't like that music. Well, I don't like this. Well, I don't like that. Hey, uh, as far as I know, no church that I'm aware of is putting on music for you. No one's worshiping you. It's all about Christ. Why would we even think this way? We are so fallen to make such mistakes in our thinking. Um, speaking of music, there's a song heard on the radio. Last week, Lauren and I were going to her grandma's house, and I think it was like a cover of a Cast and Crown song. Lauren loves Cast and Crown. And the lyric was a line from the Bible, and it says, I'm a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. And I heard that line, and I thought, wow, that is beautiful. It is so deep. It is so true. That's what we are. We are like that. We are like these beautiful little flowers so intricate and wonderful and we're quickly fading here today gone tomorrow everything you know all around you is fading it's going it's rotting it's turning to dust it's all going there's only one thing we know of that is not and that is god he is all he is all and all you know sadly a lot of people don't think this way they don't think that god's everything they think that he's a wish fairy you know, they'll go to him in prayer, and it turns into, Lord, I really want this. Lord, I really need that. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Lord, I want, 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 need, need, need. And a lot of that's a problem in our culture because instead of Christ being all and our prayers being filled with gratitude for him and who he is, there's so much of capitalism. There's so much of consumerism that has seeped into American Christianity that our prayers become capitalistic and we want that two-car um, garage and we, we want the White House with the picket fence and, and we want this and we want that and we want this shirt. I mean, people, I've heard some things that have no business in prayers. It, but there's so much of American consumerism and capitalism that has turned into another gospel, the sort of American gospel of consumer capitalism and the American dream. It's all about Christ. It's not all about the American dream. You're better off being in the wilderness like John the Baptist eating locusts and wearing some crazy camel fur than having the world and going to hell. And that's the biblical message even, isn't it? Or they'll make them, if, they, if they're not making him some kind of fairy, they make them some sort of complaint box. And they go to God and they just complain to him. Why did you do this? Why didn't you stop that? Why this? Why do I understand that? You know, I, somebody asked me a question this week, <clears throat> and they said, if you could ask God one question, if you could question God about anything, what would you question him on? My first thought was immediately, what? Who, like Paul says, in Job and, and all the great prophets and men of God of Scripture, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? If I had a chance to question God on anything, I'd take that chance not to question God on anything because God is all in all and we are finite and we are nothing. We are dust. We are nothing. We're flowers quickly fading. Who are we to question him and his plans and his decree and his sovereignty? We are nobody to do that. This is always the testimony in scripture. You can go back and look at Job and Job questions God and God doesn't even try to give him an answer. Job is reminded by God of who he is and who God is, and that God is all in all. Where were you when I stretched out the heavens? Where were you when I laid the foundation? Where were you when I did any of this? Who are you? Who do you think you are? Questioning me. Parents, you don't like your kids questioning you? Your kids are far closer to being your equal to question you than you will ever be to question the Lord God. Ever. Most of us will never even go into outer space, and God himself with his mighty hand has stretched out the outer, the outer parts of space so far we can't even fathom it. And we're going to question this being, and we can hardly even touch even the things that he's created because it is so mass and it is so intense. We can barely even touch it, but we're going to question this God. It, it's absurd. Or, you know, he's not everything to us, and, and we just turn him into a once-a-week activity or a once in, or one-hour-a-week activity. And he's not this every day, this thing that we're striving for. He's all in all, every day to us, all the time. American churches are full of idols. Um, 
that I think this year, 2020, has been remarkable to show the climate, especially the American church, <clears throat> it's not good. The American church is, I already knew it was unhealthy before 2020, but I didn't realize the depth of how unhealthy it was. It's remarkable. Um, I think it's a testimony to why we have men like Joel Osteen running the biggest churches in America. And I heard one pastor rightfully say, God giving America Joel Osteen is judgment because he's given the people what they want and he's given them that a false prophet. It's judgment. Um, we might see more judgment coming upon the American church in the years and decades to come if the American church does not repent of their idols and of their narcissistic ways, you know. Um, I've seen, just in my time in Christianity, I've seen churches choose pews over pastors. They'll get rid of a pastor before they'll get rid of a pew. Which thing did God give us? Did he give us pastors or pews? He gave us pastors. Though that You can find that in Scripture. It's given. It's ordained and decreed and given to us by God. You don't even find the word pew in Scripture. Things that God has given us, we do not esteem. And the things that we build ourselves, we esteem more than the things God has given us. To where it's apparently a painful exercise for most of the American church to worship God in his creation. Because they need to be in a building built by the hands of men. The creation of God is not a good enough space. For the American church, apparently. These are sad things. Is Christ all in all to us, or is he not? Let's stop playing games. Let's stop beating around the bush. Is he all in all, or is he not? Or do we value our little things that we build, and our little ideas, and preferences, and wants, and desires, and our in, in our just minds? What is it? Or is it him? Christ is either all to you, or he's nothing to you. There is no in-between in scripture with the Lord. Most of Christians, if I were to ask them, is Christ all to you? They would answer yes. But they're we're full of idols in this country. You know, every every generation, God commands that generation to repent. It's the same for our generation. We're not some special generation that doesn't need repenting, that doesn't need to look at our sin and our inequity and the idols that we might have created with our minds or our hands and kill them. We're just like any other biblical generation. We need to repent. Biblical South is a dangerous place, beloved. I was talking to my granddad about this yesterday. You know, in the South, and my granddad's a pastor, in the South, everybody has just enough religion to send them to hell. And they have just enough morality to send them to hell. And they have just enough knowledge about God to damn them. That's the biblical South. It is a dangerous place spiritually. You know, my granddad even reminded me of a Bible verse from 1 Thessalonians where we're told even people can believe the gospel in vain. They can hear the gospel, believe it in vain. We're warned of this in Scripture. I think the South, where I'm at, might be one of the places most guilty of, of that and most in danger of that than anywhere on the face of the earth. Like my granddad said, my granddad's 80 years old, he's a pastor, he said, you know, kids grow up in church and they hear about Jesus like they hear about George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, and they take it as fact like that, but it, it doesn't really ever settle into their heart. They believe it just on maybe some sort of intellectual level, but it never becomes a heart-level belief. It never becomes a Christ is all in all, this one I'm learning of, it because he's just like anybody else, like learning about any other historical figure. You know, I know about George Washington. He's so far from all in all to me. I don't care anything about him. I don't have him in my home. I don't start my day with him. I don't end my day with him. He's not the one I lean upon and rest upon and run to. And so it is with so many people in the American context. Um, they, they grow up in church believing the gospel in vain. You know, James even said, did he not? The demons know as much and tremble. We know a lot, a lot. <laughs> and how many people have you ever seen tremble? I can only think of a couple. I can only think of a couple. And even in my own life, if I'm honest, there's only been a few instances in my life that I've trembled. And hopefully we've all at least had one, like namely 
our salvation moment, our moment of rebirth and regeneration when God struck us with a holy fear of sin in light of His holiness. We felt the condemnation of sin upon us, and we should have trembled in fear and ran to Christ for defense. <clears throat> These are just some hard truths. And I'm sorry we have to look at them, beloved. I'm so sorry we have to look at them. Our age is an age marked with rebellion, not obedience. We're not marked with biblical submission. We're, we're marked with just catering to preferences. And we should see this pretty clearly right now in our country. And this should drive us and spur us to repentance. And we need more men of God who are called into positions of pastoral leadership and itinerant preachers. Any man of God that's been called to a leadership role, they need to stand up and take a stand and point out these things that we need repentance over rather than just catering and bending the knee for the sake of job security or anything else you know the lord's going to put me where he wants me i'm concerned i'm like convinced of that and lauren and i have we've discussed this and so i'll take whatever hits and blows come with it but the truth needs to be said just like even the puritan's prayer says right he says he he's talking about defying the adversary and becoming valiant for truth and we got to be that way we should expect our men of god that way we should want them to fire arrows at us to put to death things that need to be put to death. And this happened even in scriptural and biblical days, didn't it? You remember? And he said, um, I tell you the truth, and so I become your enemy? I tell you the truth this morning. I tell you the truth in scripture. I tell you the truth looking at scripture, looking at culture. If that causes me to become your enemy, your problem is not with me. Your problem is with scripture. Let's look at this prayer, though. It's important that, I mean, he's really drawing out a lot of this essence of what we're talking about here. And he's not looking at anything else than he's looking at Christ. Even uh, growing up in a Baptist context and SBC churches, I don't know how many times I sat in church services and almost heard nothing about God the whole time. I heard so much about man and so much about us. I mean, I'd leave church service not having any higher view of a God of Scripture at all, but hearing a ton of stuff about seven ways to make my life better in this way or that way, like I went to some kind of Oprah self-help guru convention rather than a biblical church. Um, if you have been at any church I've ever preached or pastored or taught at at all, you know I don't have anything else to say when I come to you like this or in a pulpit or outside. I don't have anything else to say but Christ because Christ is all in all. Anything else is a waste of my breath. You don't need a bigger view of yourself. You need a lower view of yourself and a higher view of God like we all do. Look at this guy, this Puritan. He gets it. He sees Christ as all in all, and he kind of goes through like the the just the linear life of Christ as from the incarnation on. <clears throat> he wants, he's begging for his heart to be melted. And he starts with the manger, doesn't he? Look at this. At the manger of thy birth. You know, why would that melt our hearts? You know, little baby Jesus, you know, the one that Ricky Bobby prays to, people laugh about all the time. Why would this melt our hearts? Do we understand who is in the manger? Do we understand who we celebrate at Christmas time? Do we understand how lowly the one who is all in all has brought himself into a condition to be found in a manger? covered in the blood of his creation and flesh. This is the appalling thing to John in John chapter 1, that him that is so high brought himself so low. And we don't even know of anything more vulnerable than a baby, do we? A baby is the most vulnerable thing that we know about. And he's brought himself into the most, the most powerful. The mightiest warrior has brought himself into to, to the most vulnerable position. The highest being has brought himself into the most lowly of places. He was found on a throne one moment, and then he's found in a manger the next moment. He's found wearing glorious, radiant robes of eternity one moment. He's found covered in a woman's birth fluids the next moment. This is remarkable. This is remarkable that the one who is all in all would be found this way. And then he goes and he says, not only that, not only in the manger of his birth, but in the garden of his agony. Look at the one who is all in all in agony. How could this not melt our hearts? That he is all in all and in agony. He's in agony because his holiness is in agony because he's about to bear unholiness. 
if you don't get this, because not everyone can get, let's get that right right now. Not everyone can get this. If you're not born again, if you don't have a renewed mind, you can't understand the spiritual depth of what we're talking about here. This is deep. This is deep stuff, and you'll never feel it without the Spirit. Test yourself as we're looking at this. Look at this. His, his heart is being melting as he's, as he's looking at the one who is all in all suffering on the cross. The one who should have never known suffering, should have never known want or thirst. Look at him suffering. He's all in all. It gets better, though. Look at this. It melts his heart, the tomb of thy resurrection. The one who is all in all. He goes into the grave, the prison of the grave, and it doesn't hold him. It cannot keep him, ha it cannot keep him ca captive because he is all in all. He is all in all. The grave cannot hold him. It cannot. It would not. It should not. It did not. He bursts forth from it in glorious right. This is shocking. This is shocking. This is good news. You read Mark's gospel, where Mark actually ends his gospel, is a little bit before your last piece of the gospel there at the end of Mark. The way Mark ends it is in this shock. You know, he's risen from the dead. We saw him. I don't, what else can I say? How? He, he's speechless. The writer is speechless. He comes across speechless, especially in the Greek. It was astonishing and shocking and glorious. And what can I say? What would you say? What would you say? You'd be speechless. There'd be no words for it. This has never happened before. We don't have any vocabulary or sentence structure to base what to say about something this intense on. And he's all in all. Praise God that he does it. And now look at this. He ends it with this. In the heaven of thy intercession. So the one who is risen is the one who ascended. And the one who ascended is the one who is coronated. Because he's all in all. He wears a crown. He has a throne. He's all in all. And he intercedes for you and I. He's, he is all in all. And yet he intercedes for lowly people like you and I. This is good news. So then he bases then his boldness because he says, bold in this thought, I may defy my adversary. This is his prayer. He knows this truth. Christ is all in all. He's all in all in these ways, and he suffered in these ways, brought himself low, and glorified himself, and intercedes for us. And he says, that causes me to be bold in my prayers as I seek to tread my adversary down. I seek to overcome his temptations, his schemes, the world, and I want to be valiant for truth. This should cause us to be so bold. Christ is all in all, and he belongs to us. Not so much as we belong to him, but he still belongs to us. This should lead us into boldness. And the Puritan says, I need a greater sense of my relationship with this one who is all in all. Him as bridegroom to me. Him as, my, as Jehovah's fellow. Him as my friend. I don't think there's a single one of us that does not need or should not want a deeper understanding of his relationship to us in these ways. As our bridegroom. As our friend, as a sinner, friend of sinners. It's no different for us today than when you're reading about it in the New Testament. Do you think he's less a friend to you, a sinner, than he was people in the first century? No, he's not. And then look, the Puritan points out the fact, like we were just talking about, we are not all in all. Listen to what he says. I think of thy glory. I think of the glory of God and my vileness. Do you think of that? Do you think of that? Or do you think you're somehow glorious? and honorable and worthy the puritans got it right he thinks his vileness we are not all in all he is all in all not only that of the majesty of god and the meanness of us god is all in all we are not of the beauty of god and the deformity of us now he's not talking about physical deformity here he's talking about moral spiritual the purity, the beauty of him and the deformity of us with sin. He is all in all. We are not. Thy righteousness, my iniquity. We are sinners. We are wretched. We are vile. He is righteous. He is the righteous one. He is the only righteous one. Any righteousness you ever find, it says this person was found to be righteous or that person was found to be righteous in Scripture. It works the same way in the Old Testament does in the New Testament. 
This is righteousness that is imputed. Imputed righteousness. Implanted righteousness is what we call this in theology. God credits that person as righteous in him according to faith. They have none of their own. You have none of your own. Does God look at you as righteous today? Yes, because of a substitute, Christ, the one who was all in all. You know, sports people, those of you that used to play sports, you know if you're not having a good game or you get weak or weary, what happens? Your coach says, hey, come here. Go sit down. Hey, you go in for him. That's what's essentially happened with us. We've been sat down. Christ has gone in and he's been substituted in our place. And he has had a perfect outing of righteousness that has been credited to our account. And we're found righteous in Christ. Now that has good news for us because that means right now, this very moment, God is pleased with you. But not only is he pleased with you, he will never be more pleased with you than you are right now, than he is with you right now. At the moment of justification, when your sins were justified in Christ and he's been perfectly pleased with you, he, will, he has never and will never ever be more pleased or happy with you than he is continuously from that moment on into the future. Now think about that. Think about, like really think about that. That means, you know, we have this weird notion that we're somehow, maybe <laughs> because of bad parenting when we grew up, I don't know, but we think well, we're trying to earn God's love. Well, I better go to church or God's going to get mad at me. Well, I better do this or God's going to get mad at me. There's no wrath for you. It's been appeased. You're looked at as Christ, as perfect, as righteous. Well, maybe when I get glorified one day, when, maybe when God glorifies me after he resurrects me, maybe then he'll love me more than he does now. No, impossible, impossible. He is perfectly pleased with you in Christ as much now as he will be a trillion, billion, gazillion years from now. Now that's good news. That's good news. So think about if you were in heaven today, how boldly could you go before the throne of God? How confidently could you approach him, understanding his love for you? How bold and confident could you approach him, knowing that? You can approach him with such boldness and confidence today in your prayers before his throne right now. And let me show you this thing at the end here. He says, thou hast died for me, may I live for thee. You know, it's easy to die for Christ. It's hard to live for him. Dying takes a moment. Living takes a lifetime. We need to be people that when we've seen he is all in all, he's so worthy and he has given up so much for somebody so unworthy as us, we should gladly live out every day for him. Like the Puritan says here, walk by his side, listen to his voice, be clothed with his graces every moment, with every movement of our mind and every pulse of our heart. Your heart's beating right now, I trust. And why is it beating? It's beating for him because he is all in all. He's always been all in all. Your heart beats for him. Your mind moves for him. Your body is given energy for him. Your lungs are given breath to praise him. And your eyes see so that you could see his word and read his word and then go live it out. None of this is about anything else but him. Parenting is all about him. Loving your spouse is all about him. Mourning a dead spouse is all about doing it for him honorably. It's all about him. Everything we should do, every move we make should find its purpose and its being in Christ. If you're doing anything outside of that, it is wasteful and it is nothing. I'm spurring you today. Let your prayers and your life and your purpose find everything in who is all in all. Because then, whoa, then we're talking about doing everything of an eternal nature with eternal ramifications. We're making it count for eternity then, aren't we? And that's what we're built for. That's what we're made for, to give him glory because he and he alone is due it. That's a pretty tall order today. This should be our prayer for today. I hope you enjoyed the Puritan's prayer. I hope it challenged you. I hope it's causing you to look at yourself more rightly, which is to bring yourself lower, and look at God more rightly, which is to bring him higher. We need to put to death cultural idols, idols within ourselves and within our minds. We need to learn to be controlled people with controlled minds, tongues, silenced complaints, full of submission, glorying in Christ, and loving one another. This is what we need more of. I love you guys. I love you. If you need me, please call upon me, okay? 
but be in prayer today and be looking to Christ every day. Love you.